Okay, class, I want you to go big on this final bit, okay? Right, five, six, seven, eight. Well done. That is great work, everyone. I'm very impressed with you, Denise. Honestly, big moves. Hello there. Uh, I'm Miles Jaff. I'd like to say mucho gracias for downloading the Friday Night Comedy podcast. Thank you, amigo. <laughs> We present the News Quiz with your host, Miles Jopp. Hello. And welcome to the News Quiz. We start with a cutting from the BBC's Newsbeat website, read by Diana Speed. A hen party going to Magaluf was removed from a plane for wearing offensive T-shirts. Airline Jet 2 said the women who were flying from East Midlands Airport to Mallorca were given several chances to cover up their T-shirts before they were removed by the flight crew. <laughs> Our thanks to Jan Halewood for sending that in. Now, let's meet the teams. Will you welcome first, on my right, Jeremy Hardy and Helen Lewis. <laughs> and opposite them, on my left, Simon Evans and stand-up comedian Desiree Birch. Jeremy, who were a less-than-magnificent seven? Well, there was a, the seven-way leaders debate, and there was an absence. Theresa May didn't show, and she left Amber Rudd in a rather invidious position. Amber Rudd sort of did all right. Theresa May was out meeting the people in a sort of heavily guarded factory that makes lemon curd or nerve gas or something. <laughs> A sort of closely vetted group of Tory activists and some selected journalists who've been driven there blindfold. <laughs> and she said this rather weird thing. They said, why aren't you going to do the debate? And she said, well, because, you know, Jeremy Corbyn just likes being on telly when he should be thinking about the Brexit negotiations. I thought, no, you should be thinking about the Brexit negotiations, but you decided to have an election instead. But perhaps she's saying that maybe Jeremy Corbyn does need to be thinking about the Brexit negotiations. <laughs> How did the uh, Home Secretary, Amber Rudd, suggest Jeremy Corbyn might fund his manifesto promises? Oh, with the magic money tree. She went Not... into a very long discussion of the rules of Monopoly, and she appears to be playing some crazy version of Monopoly that no one else <laughs> yes. played, right? When she had yellow money that she was spending one thing on. I thought she did quite well, but she was a bit headmistressy, wasn't she? It was a bit, it's your time you're wasting. And actually it turned out that everyone else had quite a lot of time to waste. <laughs> You look at it two ways. She was either sort of bravely standing in for her absent leader or preparing her challenge yeah. for her <laughs> absent-minded leader. Because she's similar to, in one way, she's, she looks like a spanker, doesn't she? Because the Tory backbenchers... <laughs> the Tory backbenchers were all sent away to aristocratic detention centres aged six, where they had to stay until they were 21, and they all like a spanky lady. And she, they do, they, they're just, they, they're all, they, you can see them, they can go, oh, I've been very naughty, Amber, I've been a very bad boy. Oh, oh. Absolutely, I mean, there's no point pretending this is just opinion, it is fact. <laughs> about financial probity is, is, a, is a real canard because the Tories borrowed money and they printed money but they called it quantitative easing which meant only only financial institutions benefited from it because most money is created by banks when you when you get a mortgage a man doesn't sort of come round and give you some coins in a leather purse <laughs> you, that you take to right move and they give you a flat well, actually, my bank, that is what they do. But uh, <laughs> you do coops. pay extra for that, but it is a lot more rewarding as an experience. <laughs> <laughs> Who made a rather personal attack on UKIP leader Paul Nuttall? Leanne Wood. It was lovely, she said. Because <laughs> he said, like, there'll be no divorce settlement, we won't be paying any money. And she said, you're the sort of bloke that would walk out of a real divorce without any settlement, you bastard, you. <laughs> And the CSA will be after you, you bastard. <laughs> <laughs> Magnanimously, this is the big debate, or to put it more accurately, the debate between the leaders or representatives of the political parties which took place on Wednesday night. Taking questions from the audience as well as responding to each other, it gave the British public a much-needed insight into seven people, one of whom in the very near future will not be Prime Minister. <laughs> UKIP's Paul Nuttall spent the entire debate in a state of non-stop indignation, his eyebrows permanently raised as if even they were trying to disassociate themselves with what was coming out of his mouth. <laughs> the UKIP leader managed to say Britain first several times during the debate, which could just have been a Freudian slip by Paul Pissbucket Bumfingers. <laughs> 
Lib Dem leader Tim Farron chose throughout to adopt the sort of intense chumminess of a man approaching tables at a harvester to perform close-up magic uninvited. <laughs> Also this week, the SNP launched their manifesto under the aspirational and optimistic slogan, Use Down South are all a bag of shite. Two points <laughs> to Jeremy. <laughs> Helen, whose lead may be disappearing? Well, we've had a... It's not a poll. I will be very clear about not calling it a poll. We've had a seat projection from YouGov, which has the Tories not even making an overall majority. And actually, overall, all the polls have showed that the Tory leader's pretty much halved over the course of May. I can't... <laughs> I can't tell you how upset I am at the concept of another election happening. But um, the trouble is, have you seen the film Up? You know that dog that goes, squirrel, and then the dog looks around. That's what polls do to an election campaign. Someone goes, poll, and we all go, and our heads whip round, and you stop talking about whatever it was you were talking about. I feel like at this point we should just look into the entrails of a pig. <laughs> <laughs> was that a David Cameron reference? Because that's... Bit... <laughs> what an appalling remark. <laughs> Are you upset by uh, the way things are going, Simon? I mean, I, I read a few months ago that there is a, a growing body of opinion that believes that everything that we experience as reality is, in fact, a computer simulation. And when I first read about this, I was sceptical. But the way that events are accelerating at the moment <laughs> does feel awfully like somebody is playing this universe and got a bit bored during the early part of the century. Every bizarre thing that you think couldn't possibly happen. Three years ago, you know, Leicester City, uh, uh, Donald Trump... Uh, Brexit, Jeremy Corbyn just being leader of the Labour Party seemed bizarre enough. And you could get, I think, 200 to 1 on him being the next Prime Minister, and it's now about 3 to 1. So, you know, with the general flow of events as it is, uh, I fully expect to be rebooted uh, by this time next week, and it won't really matter anymore. You made an interesting point that nobody two years ago would have thought that Corbyn could become leader of the Labour Party. If you'd asked me two years ago which of my friends was most likely to become <laughs> leader of the Labour Party, Jeremy would have come about 20th, <laughs> somewhere after Tim Brooke Taylor. <laughs> It just shows that, that, it, that you know, your, your expectations can be confounded. And I might be going to the House of Lords quite soon. <laughs> 300 quid a day, I tell you, I'm going. Okay. How, how would you call it, Desiree, do you think? I mean, unfortunately, I've heard too much about this election and everyone's kind of like, I mean, the same thing's going to happen. It's going to be, you know, the Tories in power and a mix-up of seats and probably some coalition thing, which is weird to me that there's just not one outright winner. Scooping it up and being a big bad boss because that's what I'm accustomed to now. It's just like King Kong in a long tie. Just like... <laughs> I don't want to be cynical. I watched the debates. I loved listening to everything Caroline Lucas said, but I know she's like a green and everyone's like, that's great. We're never going to do any of that. Thank you so much. You know? <laughs> it sounds like who's going to win is who thought she was going to win before she's called the election. What, what image did she use to describe Jeremy Corbyn when it came to Brexit? I thought I couldn't tell a joke, but she really cannot tell a joke. <laughs> she went, imagine, if you will, Jeremy Corbyn naked and alone. And then she went, yes, I know, it's terrifying. <laughs> and you just thought, well, now everyone's just thinking about you naked. <laughs> I think he should issue the challenge. All right, Theresa, you and me. <laughs> Try to strip <laughs> debate the audience votes at the end of each round. <laughs> Proper, proper it is extraordinary that polls are still given any credibility at all, though. I mean, after the last couple of years that they've had, they've been worse than useless. It's... There's, there's no other business that I can think of that could be so repeatedly, utterly worthless. It's like going to a steakhouse and not getting a medium when you ordered a rare, but instead just being given a plimsoll that's on fire. <laughs> Intermittently, these are the latest polling figures, which consistently show a narrowing of the Conservative lead over Labour, with a new YouGov poll even suggesting that there could be a hung Parliament. As always with these polls, we recommend you take them with a pinch of salt and a large helping of this is probably bollocks. <laughs> the poll does have a very wide margin of error, calculated by YouGov as almost 0.01 Diane Abbott's. <laughs> Hung Parliament would be a terrible outcome. Will no one think of poor Jeremy Vine having to demonstrate all possible outcomes to the general public, armed with nothing more than a green screen, a dressing up box, and a staggering lack of inhibitions? <laughs> On Tuesday, Theresa May said Jeremy Corbyn would be alone and naked during the Brexit negotiations. Stick an apple in his mouth, and you have my number two Brexit based erotic fantasy. <laughs>
I'm not going to tell you exactly what number one is, but it involves David Davis, a frozen condom full of Tizer, and a copy of the Treaty of Lisbon. <laughs> Two points to Helen. Simon, who's come undone in front of the ladies? Jeremy Corbyn, having weathered the, the Paxman storm quite successfully, then came rather undone in front of Emma Barnett, I believe her name is, the presenter on, on Women's Hour, who invited him on to discuss his plans for state provision of nursery places and found him unable to name a figure which would relate to the cost implications, despite the fact that he was launching this policy on the day. And there was a sort of embarrassing interlude during which Jeremy was passed various pieces of paper, an iPad, a number of beads, an abacus, <laughs> um, a photograph of his son. Um, <laughs> I apologise if I sound like a ridiculous Victorian old snob, but I do find the level of intellectual capacity of our would-be leaders at this particular election woefully short. As became clear when we were watching Jeremy Corbyn's very affable appearance on The One Show, he had insufficient A-level results to have gained a place at North East London Polytechnic in the late 1970s. His counterpart, Theresa May, just doesn't seem to be able to string the sort of sentence together that a Gladstone or a Disraeli would have recognised as such. Their second tier are absolutely woeful. Where are the people who should be leading this country? Where is the brain power? Well, have they all just buggered straight off to Silicon Valley upon graduation? I mean, what's happening? Well, they're all <laughs> looking on and making snide remarks. I, mean. I suppose so. <laughs> I saw a clip of that uh, Women's Hour interview. I felt really bad for Jeremy Corbyn because, like, no one can use their phone or their iPad while everybody's looking, you know? It's one of those, like, OK, hurry up, take a picture of us. And everyone's like, OK, uh, and then the calculator app comes up, you know? <laughs> Could he not just say, like, I don't have the figure off the top of my head. We had a bunch of really experty experts working <laughs> on the figure, and I have it written down. Can you let me find said figure? And, you know, and fill it with, like, a folksy tail while he was looking for it. Like, <laughs> he could have pulled that off. He wears yeah. jumpers. He could do that, you know? <laughs> I mean, he's much more relaxed on telly. Most people, you feel you're more under pressure on TV. And yet, without the camera to relax him, he seemed to sort of unravel. It's a bit like my, my, my grandma, who was a radio operator in the First World War, but never mastered the telephone. <laughs> if it was HQ calling, she was fine, but if it was a close relative, she went to pieces. <laughs> Also, yeah. Women's Hour is the most terrifying radio show to appear on of all of them. There is, is always someone in the green room who's there to talk about urinary incontinence. <laughs> <laughs> and if someone's patch has fallen off, you're in serious trouble in that room. <laughs> but, um... No, but the thing is, the thing that you must remember is the thing that you always forget, isn't it? Because it was obviously people who said, Jeremy, whatever you do, don't forget the costume. That's the one thing you've got. And that's too much pressure. It's like Prince Philip meeting a foreign person. <laughs> The thing that was brilliant was Jeremy Corbyn on The One Show. He talked about jam, he talked about drains. <laughs> and he did very well to look relaxed on that show, because I've done The One Show, and their teeth are blinding. <laughs> <laughs> my, my cataracts were cured by going on there. <laughs> How does it all look from your perspective, Desiree? Quite confusing. I am always asking people who live here, who are super lefty, 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 why they dislike Corbyn, why they're so angry with him. Possibly something to do with the fact that he spent most of his political career as a sworn enemy of the state. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, that, I'm just guessing. <laughs> Well, you have to remember that my country's leader is an enemy of sense. So, <laughs> I was like, Jeremy's got some numbers, he wants to help people. I'm all for putting my eggs in that basket. Yeah. <laughs> my basket is just a gaping hole in the universe. <laughs> Promptly, this is Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn's appearance on Woman's Hour, where Corbyn was stumped by a question about childcare costs, but later redeemed himself with a surprisingly moving performance as Harriet in the serialised story of a woman struggling with gender issues against a backdrop of the 18th century arts and crafts movement. <laughs> Earlier this week, Jeremy Corbyn appeared on The One Show, which was hugely enjoyable viewing, especially for anyone who's been advised by their doctor to, under no circumstances, allow their body to produce adrenaline. <laughs> Unlike Theresa May's husband, Corbyn's wife couldn't make it onto The One Show sofa due to a prearranged meeting with her self-respect. <laughs> also this week, Corbyn appeared on a Mums Net web chat, where he was accused of only answering easy questions like, what is your favourite biscuit? rather than more difficult questions like, what biscuits did you serve the IRA when you had tea with them? <laughs> Two points to Simon. Desiree, who may not always have Paris? 
really none of us if this deal goes through because it'll be underwater but um, <laughs> yes Trump is probably now as we're recording this pulling out of the Paris Accord pulling the United States out of the climate change agreement to allow us to have air I don't know he could be coming to his senses right now but you know he doesn't ever do that like, yeah. <laughs> he comes to his senses as often as like Melania comes to the White House which is just, like never you know <laughs> um, I read this report in which he said the accord would cost trillions of dollars with no tangible benefit he said while breathing air <laughs> so yeah he's he's currently ruining the environment because america is the second largest producer of greenhouse gases after china and even china still in the agreement only syria and Nicaragua are like, yeah, no, nah, everyone hates us anyway. Doesn't matter. Yeah. You know? What can and you expect from a man who's actually named after a greenhouse gas? <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is fair. This is fair. But yeah, I mean, I'm amazed that he's fathered five children and now he's interested in pulling out of something. Like, <laughs> Too late. <laughs> this is always the problem with Trump is that, that, you, that isn't even the craziest story about him this nope. week, right? So the other thing is, having spent an entire election campaign sort of talking about her emails, Hillary's emails being on locker up, it turns out he's been going around giving out his phone number, his personal phone number. And then I found out who he's been giving his personal phone number to. So Emmanuel Macron, France, Justin Trudeau of Canada. All the hot ones. And the president of Mexico, he's a fox. Hey. The man is lonely. He's lonely <laughs> like that. <laughs> <laughs> Just 3 a.m. text of who dis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Simon, are you for or against the Paris Accord? Well, I suppose as, as the sort of token uh, Nazi on the panel, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like a sort of monolithic consensus on Radio 4 panel. But the hell. Yeah, OK, he's an <laughs> idiot. Yeah, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> there is still this tiny, tiny glimmer of hope, isn't there, that Trump is playing some three-dimensional chess, as his fans want us to believe. He just completely bamboozles everyone with his extraordinary <laughs> apparent lunacy and uh, that suddenly it's all going to fall into place and we will all realise that he's been playing on an entirely different level from the rest of us. But that does seem to be a narrowing possibility. <laughs> <laughs> Previously, this is the news that Donald Trump is to pull out of Paris, yet another move he's copied from Hitler. Trump... <laughs> Trump says leaving the Paris Climate Change Agreement could lead to more jobs, with millions of Americans being employed in the future as feral desert scavengers. <laughs> Trump continues to overestimate how well an overweight simpleton will fare in the post-apocalyptic world he's creating. <laughs> Donald, all the gold lifts in the world won't save you come Cannibal Tuesday. <laughs> Trump told other world leaders they could call him on his cell phone. Trust me, Donald, the last thing you want to do is be dragged into Macron and Trudeau's WhatsApp group. It's all baby pictures and plans for a caravanning holiday that will never happen. <laughs> also this week, Nigel Farage has been named as a person of interest in the FBI investigation into US links with Russia, which is striking given that Nigel Farage is not normally a person of interest even at a dinner party. <laughs> One in which the only attendees are you and Nigel Farage. Uh, two points to Desiree. At the end of round one, the scores are Jeremy and Helen have four, and so too to Simon and Desiree. We start round two with an extract from the Northern Ireland Humanists Facebook page. Come meet like-minded folk at our secular brunch for Vickers Restaurant in County Armagh. <laughs> well, thanks to David Harrison for sending us that. Jeremy, have a listen to this. Let's fly away, away, let's fly away. Let's make hay before we get too old and gray. If you love me as you say, don't you worry, come what may. Let's fly away, let's fly away. Jeremy, who was not the world's favourite airline this week? <laughs> uh, well, it, 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 the clue's in the clue, isn't it? It's um, <laughs> British Air. I've always not quite liked British Airways. I quite like Ryanair. There's your seat. There's no frill. Sit anywhere you like. If you survive, you'll be doing well. Uh, British Airways has always been that, oh, welcome to British Airways. <laughs> I mean, I'm not, I'm not anti-British. I like the word British in front of museum, for example, or broadcasting, or even rail, to be honest. Um, but... <laughs> Not so much in front of National Party or Airways. 
Um, <laughs> I just, there's a smugness, there's a hubris, and they, they've had it coming. This week they had to turn all their planes off and turn them on again, and they still didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> they said at all what's to blame, uh, B.A.? I saw a, a thing saying their um, uninterruptible power source uh, was interrupted. Right. <laughs> Does it mean uninterruptible as in uh, it can't be interrupted or it really mustn't? <laughs> when you find these incredibly high-tech things break down, it's often something incredibly low-tech. The entirety of Ukraine lost its internet once because someone put a spade through the cable. And the Large Hadron Collider went down last year because a weasel immolated itself in the, uh, in the power supply. Wow. Oh, I hate when that happens. <laughs> <laughs> Have you any experience of British Airways, Desiree? Oh, God, no, I can't afford that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm like, if it's not Norwegian or Ryan or, you know, EasyJet, you I've never flown it. You get one of those United it. Airlines flights where they have the special treatment. <laughs> yeah, deep tissue with shiatsu massage with every United flight. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> very, very deep. People do take this high-tech stuff for granted, though. The fact is that <laughs> flying is, is now just so available to everybody. And I mean, I remember when, when you used to want to go on holiday, you had to go to Thomas Cook in the high street, because there was no internet in those days. And you go to Thomas Cook and you'd say, hello, I'd like to go somewhere, please. And they'd say, have you thought about abroad? I said, I don't know, what's it like? Everyone's very friendly. Good, I'll go there. <laughs> and they would just give you a holiday. You didn't have to research. It would just be an envelope that said, these are your documents. Your name is Armand. You're a Belgian commercial traveller. <laughs> You went, you know. Now you spend years online like a demented archivist. <laughs> and you're just about to click to accept. You say, oh, no, someone on TripAdvisor's criticised a soap dish. Oh! <laughs> That's years of research down the drain. Huh? Vanishingly, this is the catastrophic IT disaster suffered by British Airways, leading to the cancellation of hundreds of flights. Some have blamed all this on a power surge, others on poor contingency planning. I, however, shall continue to pin the whole thing on the Wright brothers and their perverse mocking of the will of God that only ever invited the harshest of retribution. <laughs> Nearly 300 flights were cancelled worldwide on Saturday with reports of families sleeping at airports on yoga mats, which can't have been comfortable as that is not what yoga mats are designed for. They're supposed to be rolled up and kept under the bed for all eternity. <laughs> As a result of the chaos, BA were unable to process bookings or contact staff, except by sending up a plane with a canister of red smoke to spray the words, does anyone have a working number for Rob from IT support? <laughs> In the skies over Hounslow. It took until Wednesday for BA to reunite passengers with their bags. We've had a lovely week in Grand Canaria, and I don't know what all the fuss is about, commented a lovely couple of matching Samsonite suitcases. <laughs> Two points to Helen. Simon, why did one of Britain's heroines get some positive news? Oh, heroin. OK, so this is, um, this is Angela Rippon, a veteran newsreader and presenter. It came to light that somebody had um, failed a drugs test. I think he works at a nuclear facility or something where they're quite strict about this. He failed a drugs test because they found traces of opiates in his bloodstream. And he was utterly bamboozled by this and then began to suspect that they were coming from poppy seeds because he was fond of that kind of loaf. And, um, I mean, this just sounds utterly implausible. But anyway, he raised it with this consumer affairs program and they decided to look into it. And Angela Rippon ate five loaves or something <laughs> and um, <laughs> then had the blood test. And lo and behold, she did indeed have a visible level of... I mean, yeah. I suppose this is... I, I know I'm harping on on this a little bit this evening, but again, the sorry degraded state of our population that you can no longer eat a poppy seed loaf without being d deemed unfit to operate heavy machinery. I mean, <laughs> there was a time when a certain amount of opium was sort of re regarded as a healthy thing to have in your bloodstream if you, were, <laughs> if you had a bit of manual labour ahead of you, you know, drowsed with the fume of poppies and so on. I've never tried heroin myself, OK? I, oh, no, you yeah. must. I know. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder you look I've so had, tired, Simon. I've had, a, <laughs> I've had a couple of codeine, <clears throat> you know, when I've been feeling a bit poorly. I can't believe that the poppy seeds you can ingest through any remotely plausible amount of bread is going to be enough to raise it above the level of coat. I mean, what is going on, for God's sake? <laughs> <laughs> but, yes, anyway, so that's it. You can now get sufficiently off your nut, uh, licking bloomers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've never failed a drugs test because I've always had jobs where nobody cares, like teaching in public schools. <laughs> Uh, but uh, apparently the amount of opiates in a poppy seed muffin or bagel can vary by a factor of 600. 
which is incredible to me that like someone at Starbucks could be like, I got some high grade, high cut loaf for you right now. Come back, come in the back, come in the back. Because how would you do loaf? I don't, anyway. Um, Crush it and snort it. Yeah. Uh, surely. <laughs> well, with wholemeal, you'd never be able to breathe again. <laughs> You'd use your, your blender to turn it into uh, oh, like breadcrumbs. Yeah. You can't have a drug smoothie. That's the most middle-class thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> so the loaves come from Afghanistan, or do they do... Is that... I mean, the different where just... they come from. Poppies are poppies. I don't want to think that the bloomers are funding the Taliban. That's my main concern. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you I get all my heroin from a farmer's market in Sussex. It's... <laughs> <laughs> Blazingly, this is the news that as part of a TV investigation into drug testing in the workplace, veteran presenter Angela Rippon ate a loaf of poppy seed bread and subsequently tested positive for opiates. This came about after a man was fired from his job at a power station for failing a drugs test and blamed it on the toast he had for breakfast in what, to use the drug testing terminology, is an absolute wiggins of an excuse. <laughs> The most difficult part was finding a container big enough for the sample. Honestly, that woman is part shire horse. <laughs> the test occurred during the BBC One show Rip Off Britain as part of an item on the poor value of the licence fee. <laughs> Two points. <laughs> to Simon. Before we reveal the final score, has anybody got a cutting that they'd like to share? This, Miles, was sent in by Jeff Nathanson, and he heard a piece of commentary from Phil Neville on Five Live this week. The design of this arena really helps the atmosphere. It's brilliant. The acoustics are the best I've ever seen. <laughs> Hello. Michael Scott saw this in a Wildlife Trust magazine. Rush Meadows is a quiet and secluded haven for wildlife situated on the outskirts of Deerham. It sits in an unlikely location hidden behind Deerham's sewage works, where from the banks of the river, visitors may be treated to the plop of a water vole. <laughs> As it slips back into the water. <laughs> Desiree. Darren Pryor saw this on the Reading Freegal website, which is for people to get rid of unwanted things. Offer, clothes hangers. I've got a black bag of coat and clothes hangers. Some kids in there as well. <laughs> <laughs> Reluctant to send to landfill. <laughs> Thank you. And now let's take a look at the final score. Jeremy and Helen have eight, but this week's winners are Simon and Desiree with nine. Yeah. Before we leave you, here's a cutting from Graham Lowry, who saw this notice on a yoga centre in Bromsgrove. Please note that this week's postnatal yoga class is postponed due to maternity leave. <laughs> and with that, goodbye. Taking part in the news quiz with Jeremy Hardy, Helen Lewis, Simon Evans and Desiree Birch. On the chair was Miles Jupp and the news was read by me, Diana Speed. The chair script was written by John Hunter, James Kettle and David Reed, with additional material by Jenny LaVille. The producer was Joe Nunnery and it was a BBC Studios production. Thank you ever so much for listening to the podcast. For more information, head on over to bbc.co.uk slash radio4. It's a website. Thank you, licence fee.